everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Amplify Horse Racing Hangouts. I am your host, Anise Montpleasure, president and co-founder of Amplify Horse Racing and equine education coordinator for the Kentucky Equine Education Project. If you are new to Amplify or new to the Amplify Hangouts, this is uh, Amplify's monthly virtual event that we put on basically where we have industry professionals who represent a variety of different careers and jobs in the thoroughbred industry or in the general equine industry join us for a conversation about what their jobs are the training that they need to do those jobs jobs that are in demand right now in the industry and ways that you can apply or even action points for you to start working your way into those positions. Amplify Horse Racing is a 501c3 nonprofit promoting education and careers in the thoroughbred industry to youth and young adults. And we are so glad to have you on with us today. So usually I go through a whole ton of announcements and I'm actually going to skip that tonight. We're really going to dive into this topic, which I'm really excited about. For anyone who's tuned in to our earlier episodes this season, our season's theme this year is how to. So we're really focusing on in-demand areas of the industry, in-demand jobs, and those action points on how you can start working your way into those jobs. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with Amplify, you know that we offer a mentorship program where we pair uh, young adults with industry professionals to start working towards careers in the industry. And a large percentage of our mentee applicants this year have had an interest in the veterinary world. So tonight's episode is really going to focus on careers in equine healthcare, careers and jobs. I think a lot of people, when they picture uh, the veterinary world or veterinary medicine or even um, supporting roles in equine healthcare, a lot of times your mind automatically goes specifically to veterinarian and maybe a veterinarian that, you know, pulls up in your truck or in their truck to your farm um, to serve and take care of your horses or serve particular clients. And that is true of some veterinarians, but there is actually a, a much wider world out there of veterinarians who have different specialties and then all of the support services and staff and employees who support um, equine healthcare facilities. And so tonight I am joined by not one, not two, but three amazing speakers and three amazing and powerful women who I have a tremendous amount of respect for. All three of them have done an exceptional amount to prepare for this episode, so I'm really excited to welcome them on. Um, I cannot wait to introduce you to Dr. Deborah Spike Pierce, Dr. of Veterinary Medicine, Pre President, CEO of Ridden Riddle Equine Hospital, Aaron Mathis, Barn and Facility Facilities Manager at Rudin Riddle, and Alana Mathis, Intern, Extern, Liaison, and Technician Manager, also at Rudin Riddle Equine Hospital. So welcome to this amazing Rudin Riddle team. Thank you guys so much for being on. Thanks for having us. Hi. Debbie, I'm going to have you kick us off before we dive into how all of you made your way into your particular careers. Can you give us an overview of what Rudin Riddle does in the equine populations that you all serve? Wow, that's an ever encompassing question. And, and Rudin Riddle is a very large equine hospital. And um, our goal has always been to provide our clients and our horses with the very best in veterinary care and veterinary expertise and, and do so in a caring manner that is beneficial for everybody in the entire equine industry. And we, we are a large hospital and with that we have many specialties. And the thought has always been, you know, we want to be the Mayo Clinic of the equine veterinary world. And if you ever get a chance to come visit us, it, it really is like that. You know, we have every specialty and horses will come throughout the clinic. And if they need to see one specialist, specialist then they can go on and see another specialist if, um, if they need to. So um, it's an all encompassing from the reproductive to um, lameness <coughs> and, and just preventative care as well. I was going through your all's website and it has all of your services, surgery, equine podiatry, internal medicine, ambulatory services, reproduction, diagnostic imaging, 
and laboratory. I know that it can be, you know, hard to define and explain all of those, but if you could give, you know, maybe a very short description of what goes into to each of those, how, you know, would you be able to do that? I could. Well, okay, surgery. We'll start with that. Okay, so for surgery, we do everything from the emergency surgeries, which is are mostly colics and um, C sections, maybe lacerations. Um, there's also orthopedic, which is what we are very well known for because we have some very um, strong surgeons in that area. And that's for anything from plating fractures and fixing broken legs to arthroscopies, which are often done in racehorses and young horses as well, as well as corrective surgeries. In racehorses, there's also, as well as other horses, there's also upper respiratory surgery. Mm -hmm. So many different areas of expertise. There's also reproductive surgeries, dentistry, a lot of dental surgeries. So everything that you can think of, really, we do it in equine medicine as well. Okay. Equine podiatry. Podiatry is really intriguing. You know, that is something that started hmm, probably 20 years ago in our practice. And it's, it's really grown because there is such a need to have a working relationship with a veterinarian who really understands the foot. And I have to be one to admit that that wasn't really um, my, my forte, as many people aren't, because we don't really know how to shoe them. But the podiatrists truly look at the function of the foot and what they can do and how they can shoe them to make them perform better. Or in many cases, it could be a laminitis case. You know, how can we keep these horses going and improve techniques to extend life in, in some horses? Internal medicine. Internal medicine can be anything from the sick foal, new foals, to pneumonias and um, what else do we have? Maybe it's an older horse, the geriatric horse or a horse that's losing weight. You know, just something that we can, a horse would come in and then they can do a full workup. Maybe they're going to scope their stomach. They'll do complete blood work. They'll do a good physical exam. And then we have many other diagnostic imaging that can help us determine what's wrong with the horse and a proper treatment. Ambulatory services. Ambulatory is all encompassing. So in ambulatory, we for the most part, come to your farm and do preventative care, number one. But in the thoroughbred world, we will also evaluate yearlings and look at horses that are going to sale. So we'll do a lot of x-raying and ultrasound and upper respiratory endoscopy. So looking at their airways to see what their potential is as a racehorse. Um, we also have just regular, you will also have emergencies at the farm, just like you have in here. There's some that we can control at the farm and treat, and there's others we cannot. Dentistry is, is also part of ambulatory, and reproduction is a large part of it in the central Kentucky area. So breeding mares and, and foaling out horses. That's really yeah. interesting. I actually didn't realize that all of those different areas kind of were encompassed under ambulatory. And I should also include sport horses are also under ambulatory, which that is where we go out and for the most part are looking at horses that are lame or doing pre-purchase exams for people that are wanting to buy horses to go on and, and show and they need to be maintained. So we do a lot of that as well. Reproduction. I'd imagine you guys are pretty busy right now in this area this time of year. They are. They're crazy busy. And with the thoroughbreds, most of that is done in the ambulatory um, in field because it's live cover with the thoroughbreds, but there are a lot of other breeds that it's not all live cover. So we do a lot of embryo transfer, artificial insemination, or timed breeding for these animals. And we're doing a lot of other really interesting, they do some oocyte aspirations, a lot of things I never even dreamed of that we would be doing in horses. But the advanced theory is really big as well as collecting stallions and freezing semen that they do for the other breeds. Diagnostic imaging. Diagnostic imaging has changed so much in the last 20 years, it's amazing. So we do radiography and ultrasound. Those have been our mainstay and have been here really since I started. But since then we have also have acquired nuclear scintigraphy. That is where they have a, um, they look at a horse from uptake of a nuclear 
radioisotope basically into active areas of the bone, which is very important in performance horses. Then we have an MRI. We have a one and a half Tesla MRI, which we can look at all structures. We got a CT, a couple of CAT scan a couple of years ago, and that's proving to be extremely beneficial. And just mm -hmm. last week, we got a PET scan. So that's oh, very exciting. exciting. And that's, that's about like the nuclear scintigraphy or bone scan, which many of you have probably heard it that way, but it's a 3D. <clears throat> so it's kind of a combination of a CT, MRI and bone scan, but very exciting. Yeah. <laughs> Imaging world. That's cool. And laboratory. Laboratory, we do about everything that you can imagine. So the blood work for a sick animal, we'll do Coggins, we do cultures, which all these breeding horses, they need to be cultured before they go to the shed. And we do a lot of, a lot of that is emergency type work in hospital where we're really monitoring these horses closely. But then we also receive lab work from outside veterinarians and as well as our own staff, just monitoring individuals and seeing how to best treat them. That's a really good overview. And something that I think <coughs> is really important for our audiences to have as we dive into each of your roles within the organization, because it really goes to show how massive and all-encompassing and and varied all of the different um, pieces of the equine veterinary world really are and to have all of that in one facility is is pretty amazing so i also want to remind anyone out there watching if you have questions for aaron or alana or dr spike pierce anywhere that you're watching right now whether you're watching on youtube twitter facebook you can comment on this stream as you're watching live and we can actually pull up those questions and answer them live. And I would really love to do that. So now is, this is always the way that I, I start the show. I always want to know how each of you first became interested in the equine industry to begin with, and then the pathway after that, that led you to actually working in it. So Aaron, I'm going to start with you on that. Okay. Um, well, I was raised with horses, um, family born and raised, like all of us are in the horse industry, um, my siblings and my parents <clears throat> and, um, worked my way through college, um, at a thoroughbred farm and came into the clinic, Ridden Riddle with a colic when I was, um, in the middle of that and got, got offered a job interview and took it. And my first year was 1994 here. It's 20. 28 years ago, I think, something like that. Um, and I started off in the barn personnel and we were a lot smaller than we only had three barns at that time. And within four months, I was the barn supervisor and wow. just kept going from there. Actually, Dr. Spike Pierce and I, the first year, uh, were the same year because she was an intern here and we became friends that year. But, um, and I learned as I went, um, worked a lot alongside, we were obviously a lot smaller then. And, um, so at that point I get, you wanted to be involved in anything you could, you could. So I learned to help recover horses. I mean, I helped drop emergencies. Um, I would go out in the field with veterinarians to take x-rays for the sales. Um, anything and everything held bone scans, got to participate in a lot. And that's what I liked the most about the clinic starting off early is you could, be involved in so much then you can still now, but uh, for the most part, we're obviously a lot bigger than we were. So that's kind of how I got started in the industry. <clears throat> I think your story, you know, how it started, the fact that you brought in a horse that had colic and then was offered a job interview right there really goes to show how, you know, if somebody watching out there is working on a farm right now, whatever you're doing, it's really important to always be making an impression um, but did you always know that you wanted to work in the industry, you know, based on the fact that your family was involved? Because I know some kids decide to go in the other direction when they're that immersed in it all the time. Um, you know, before I came here, I wanted to be a veterinarian. I was going to school for engineering at the time. Um, my parent, my mom talked me out of being a vet. And um, then I came here and... Uh, well, I, I'm not gonna lie. After uh, four months here, I did not want to be a veterinarian um, because it, it's not it's it's not just a career; it's a lifestyle. Um, but my job's a lifestyle too, so I feel like I was better, definitely better as sports staff. Um, 
And I do think people that are in the long term in the horse industry have a passion for the horse. And those are the ability to learn what we can here is probably the biggest draw that I could say. I mean, you can, the sky's the limit, what you can learn at, while working in any part of the hospital. I mean, because if you are willing to learn, they're usually very willing to teach. I think that's, that's a good lesson for anyone out there too, who might, you know, maybe have an interest in being a veterinarian, but they aren't sure if they want that to be their lifestyle all the time. That's, I think, a big part of why we want to have this episode tonight is to show all of the surrounding careers and emphasize some of those underlying factors. Like, you know, you are going to have to work hard. It's important to learn a lot of different aspects of, you know, the facility that you're working for. And I want to circle back around with you, Aaron, because you wrote something really amazing about horsemanship when we were going back in our emails. But I'm going to go on to Alana. Alana, I'd love to hear your story of how you became interested in it. My, my son's talking to me. He's work. He also works at the clinic. So it's kind of, <laughs> there's been several of us that have been through there. Or, um, yeah. Um, so I also wanted to be a veterinarian like Aaron. Um, I grew up with horses. Uh, we, I guess I was 11 years old when I got my first horse and I didn't know there was um, a facility like Root and Riddle. You know, we, you have horses, you have injuries, you have colic, stuff like that. Um, it's just going to happen. And so kind of found out through that way. And, and then my roommate, Shannon, um, wanted to also be a veterinarian and she happened to work at the clinic and she brought me in for an interview for a uh, following season. And I was hired <clears throat> on seasonally in the nursing staff and just, I loved it. Um, it was something different every day. That's one of the things that I really enjoy. It's still like that for me. Uh, it's not the same things that you do every day. You know, there's, I'm not going to say there's nothing about my job that I would like to not have to do sometimes, but for the most part, it's just interesting because, you know, it's, it's different um, most days. Um, so from there, I just, you know, stayed on and in, in, I think it was 2006, we decided um, to combine the tech groups. And so I was over them as, as I interview most people for those positions. And it was just made sense to interview them all um, and tell them about each job that we had, because we, we really want to put people in positions that they are the most interested in so that they um, enjoy their job uh, like we enjoy our job. Um, so, yeah, that's how I got. I, I started in 1993, I think. So. And Dr. Spike Pierce. So my father was an equine veterinarian and my grandfather was a veterinarian. I had several uncles that were veterinarians and I really, really wanted to be a veterinarian. Actually, I decided that pretty early. I was I think I was nine when at prior up to that point, we had standard bred racehorses at our farm and in Jersey cows. That was the other thing that we had, but I really wanted a horse, not a cow. So I spent a lot of time with my dad and I just, he was amazing and everything that, you know, he could fix. It seemed like it was, it was a job where you could fix something all the time and, and see the results too, especially in racehorses. That was the really fun part is then watching them race and going on to, to do well. And so I decided about then, but I was always into horses, into show horses. And when I was in vet school, I'd always intended just to go work for my dad. I never intended on going anyplace else. And I came down to Rudin Riddle the very end of my senior year. And I was just amazed. I'd, I had no idea what was out there and what you could do. And so I practiced with my dad for a year, Standard Red Racetrack. And then I applied for an internship and came down here. And, and then I applied for surgery residencies because I wanted to be like the surgeons and I didn't get one. And I ended up staying on here and just love it. And I love, I, it was mostly the people and just the knowledge, like both of them have spoken, you can learn so much. And that's what really struck me as a, a young equine veterinarian was, oh my goodness, the sky's the limit. And, and what you can do is as well. There's, there's so many different things. It doesn't have to be practicing veterinary medicine. You can go into industry, you know, maybe you work for research or a drug company or something, you know, helping horses in that way. So there's a lot of different ways you can work in it. Um, I love the lameness and orthopedic part of it. That's why I 
stayed here and have continued to, to work here in that. So uh, really you can do anything with it. So it's a great career. What would you say was the, the greatest challenge that you had to overcome as a young veterinarian and learning where your, you know, where your major strengths lied? Well, I had to really look back to my mentors. I had a lot of mentors. I had a lot of great people. When I worked with Dr. Bramlage, which he was, he's an orthopedic surgeon that I worked with for three years after my internship. You know, he always said, find out what you really like and become really good at it. And I think it takes you a little while to figure out what you really enjoy and what you really like. And, and I knew I wanted to be like him. I mean, I was interested in his stuff. So I spent a lot of time reading x-rays, reading all the reports of everything after him. So anything he read, I would read them. And by doing that, I did, I became good at what I did. The other thing that I did was research and making sure that we had um, some data for our clients when we're recommending horses and we're telling them about problems, being able to tell them how they're going to do was really important as well. But I think it all stems back to mentors, you know, who you want to be like and really just developing your sole interest. And oftentimes it's because you became really good at it is why you really like it. Erin, I want to, something that I, I hear from a lot of you guys as you're telling your stories is there definitely seems to be a balance between the people side and then the hands-on horse side of things. And Alana, you mentioned that you deal a lot with, you know, hiring of people and making sure that you're putting in an area, putting them in an area where they're going to be really strong. Erin, you mentioned, you know, horsemanship and you're working with a team as you know I'd, I'd love for you to describe your day-to-day -day job and then i want to go into you know where horsemanship really applies so let's let's start with the describe what your day-to-day -day is like aaron you want oh, it depends on the day <laughs> yeah right. um let's see well this time of year spring um i manage the um Two of the crews I manage are the admissions and barn crew. Uh, the barn staff are the ones that uh, do primarily most of the cleaning, um, taking care of the patients in the barns. Um, the admissions crew primarily admit and discharge patients, deal with the clientele, liaison, like they kind of run the flow of the horses as they come in and out of the hospital. Um, and this time of year, I'm mostly hands-on with admissions um, because we have such a large caseload coming in and out, including emergencies. So I'll come in and get with them on scheduling. And I think there's 14 of them between first and second shift to do that. And I help admit and discharge patients. Um, this time of year, I'm also working in the barns. We have a lot of new staff. Um, so I'll either make sure they um, understand biosecurity protocols or just helping anyone and everybody I can. Um, the horsemanship thing I talked about was that um, we don't see a lot of people that have a vast amount of horse experience than what they used to hire. Um, you know, the horse industry has changed so much that um, a lot of, especially in the thoroughbred industry, people are grandfathered in. They had a family member that worked at a farm and either they started working at a farm or they did it when they were in high school or college and either kept doing it or loved it. But now more we're having a harder time finding those people. So I teach a lot of hands-on horse skills to whomever want to be involved, um, especially when it comes to um, loading patients, because I mean, some of these horses that come in here never been off the farm, either they're yearlings or babies or race horses. And it's, um, we're at 22 acres of blacktop. So it's, gets a little hairy sometimes when we have 12 horses leaving at the same time. Um, so those are the challenges that I like to deal with. I like my hands on the horses. Um, I like to teach, I like to teach patients and how to read a horse, body placement. Um, also just have a look professional when you're getting your butt drug across the parking lot. I mean, <laughs> um, it does happen. <laughs> hey, that's real. That's, that's it, it, real it's life, a real right? thing. Um, and some of the things that we do to get, I mean, get some of these horses on that are scared or just want to see what else is going on. It, it, it does. I like the challenge of that. 
I love, I love to teach. That's a big thing. That's a big part of it. So when I say the lack of horsemanship, it's the willingness to learn and to listen mm -hmm. and to do the work because you don't take a course and know how to know how to handle a difficult patient in a week, a month, a year, you know? So, mm -hmm. um, we like people to stay. Um, we want to teach and educate them, put as much as we can into them because a, it makes it more engaging and, but also, I mean, they make us look good. So mm -hmm. my day to day is, could be anything from filling pharmacy orders for meds to go home to, um, educating personnel to, I don't know, everything. I mean, anything and everything. Um, client trailer breaks down. I'll jump in our truck and trailer, go pick up their horse. Um, wow. so that we also um, have a recipient farm that I'm um, facility manager out there too. So we have client horses that come back and forth that we haul in and out. So I'll be one of those people that do that too. So it is a little bit of everything. And that's what I love about it. Uh, honestly, it's I don't sit at, I sit at the desk a little bit more than I used to, but I'll never be a hundred percent desk jockey mm -hmm. because I like to be outside. And I think that the more you get to know the people that you work with, I mean, the better off you are. If there's anybody out there right now who might be working in a different aspect of the industry, like maybe a young person who's working on a farm and has an interest in coming to work at a place like Rudin Riddle, what are some of the really important hands-on skills that you would like to see them have before they come into the hospital to work with you, Aaron? Um, gosh, you know, we're not picky anymore. <laughs> um, if you could be picky, be. <laughs> there might be some um, people out there who are taking notes and they want to know exactly what they need to learn. Honestly, um, I, I've even been hiring people that have had divorce experience lately. Wow. Uh, if they have any sort of thoroughbred experience with yearlings, racehorses would be nice to have. I mean, for people that really want to break into the industry and want to get a hands-on feel, a lot of the um, trainers are hiring hot walkers right now and they will, they will train them from the bottom up. But I think actually someone that would work at a thoroughbred farm and put in longer than a month, six months up we get a lot of people that'll be there for three months and be like yeah it's not really what we want put time into a job that's the one advice i would give you no matter what put your time in it's a good reference but if you do want to go work at a thoroughbred farm a lot of the smaller farms you, you can work with bears and foals you can work with yearlings sometimes layups um but i would say that if you are willing to come and recognize that there is a lot of hard work involved I will give most anyone a chance. I mean, that's a true story on that. Um, mm -hmm. There's not many people I won't interview um, just because I also recognize that we, I have for personality also, meaning we, I look for go-getters, um, someone with it shows me that they have a work ethic, but outgoing personality, non-negative. Um, but the big thing is, is we look for upbeat people and we also look for people that are excited. They want to come work here. Mm -hmm. It's definitely a big thing, even even with our mentorship program program that we do through Amplify. A big piece of it is being mentorable. And I heard a lot of you, you know, reflect on your mentors and all that you learn from your mentors. And Aaron, you just talked a lot about shaping the people who come in to work for you. You know, they have to have that uh, receptive personality that they're open to learning and, you know, understanding that you can't come in thinking that you know it all because horses will humble you very, very quickly. So I think that's a, you know, that's really good for people to know. Alana, I know that you work, you know, a lot more with the people, focusing in on putting people in positions where they're going to be successful. What is your day-to-day -day like? Um, like Aaron's, it, it varies a lot. It also varies uh, the different time of year. Uh, I do a lot of interviewing in the fall to try to find the people that we need for the spring. Um, I do a lot of making sure everybody has the help that they need in in the in my areas. So, you know, if an ambulatory veterinarian who doesn't normally have an assistant needs someone to go and help take surveys, um, you know, I have to go through my people and find out who can go and, and schedule that for them. Um, if somebody is out in a different area or a clean tech or, you know, a a role that needs to be filled and I will also go through the list of people and kind of fill that in as well. Um, I can help a little bit in each area that I manage. Um, 
I do a lot of also talking about just the different jobs, talking to veterinary students um, that are visiting or externing and just kind of explaining our internships. And um, I do a lot of coaching the younger staff that we have that are in leadership roles. Uh, for me right now, that's one of the things that I really enjoy that I find job satisfaction is seeing them progress as young leaders and the enthusiasm that they show for the job and just it's infectious. And like Aaron, I like people who want to be there, who are, you know, the world's not out to get them. They're happy. They're, you know, you come in and, and you work hard and we take care of you, I think. And so that's, you, you know, you you probably hear things about the clinic of people who are not there anymore, but the people who come in and work hard, they can really move up if that's what they want to do. And like Aaron said, they can learn in other areas. If they, they do have to put some time in, they need to learn their area first. But we do a lot of um, placing people in either if they we promote from within, if we have an opening, say like for the PET scan, we hired an additional imaging person. So we now have somebody from surgery, somebody from the nursing staff, um, as, as well as the person who, who did the scans before that they all, you know, share that role. And so they kind of rotate through there. It makes their days more interesting. It's just a lot of kind of plugging people in where they need to go. And, you know, I also have a lot of meetings. So, um, yeah, it's it's. It's, it's, I enjoy it. Can you explain the difference between an intern versus an extern and how someone who might be interested in, in one of those could apply? Sure. Do you want, do you want to explain that, Dr. Spark, or do you want me to? Okay. So an extern, um, would, we have two different types of externs, actually. We have veterinary tech externs. They're students that are in school um, try to get the veterinary technician program, or we have veterinary interns that are externs, sorry, that are in school and are interested in maybe pursuing an internship after they graduate vet school. So they are able to visit our facility. We have on-site housing uh, and they can stay for up to two weeks um, if they are in one of those programs and they can see the different areas of the hospital and potentially ap apply if they're interested in uh, working with us, so. I have several friends who have done internships with Rude and Riddle at, at some point in time and all of them reflected on the very thorough, amazing experience that they had. Is that something where someone could apply online if they were interested in becoming an intern? They could apply online. Yes, I, I do. We do encourage them to visit. But with COVID, things have changed. So we have hired um, a few interns that have not visited before. We do, you know, Zoom interviews and um, obviously check references and that kind of thing. But, you know, it's something that if you work at Rude and Riddle, you have a network for the rest of your career. You know, I my office mate is actually Dr. Bramwich and I'll hear interns that were there five, 10 years ago call in. He picks up the phone just like they never left and answers questions, offers advice or looks at extra, you know, anything like that. So that I think that's something that people um, it, you could easily underestimate that. I think it's really valuable to be able to do that. And, you know, the, the field interns, they also call the in-house clinicians and same thing. You know, it, it's it, it is one of the things that Dr. Rood said when I first started was, you know, he looked for people that were better than he was in, in certain areas. And there is the ego is not there. If, if it's not their specialty, they will refer it to whoever, you know, it is their specialty. So I think that's really nice um, as well, because that way, you're, you know, the horse is going to get the best that it can get. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Alana. Dr. Spike Pierce, I know that your role is, you know, probably very multifaceted in all that you do, and there's probably not a typical day, but how, what would a typical week look like? Because I'd imagine every day is probably very different. Well, it's very different than practicing veterinary medicine. I'll have to say that. I mean, I still am around the horses and the people, which is fantastic. But it's a lot of different things. You know, as CEO, your, your, your job is to grow the business and to make sure everybody gets paid. So with that, I have to deal with a lot of like accounts receivable, you know, things that we have to be able to collect our money. Um, if there's complaints, that's what I get to hear, which is probably my least favorite part of the job, but it's necessary. And just to make sure that we always respond and improve on, you know, things that are brought up. I try to meet with people, especially the veterinarians, 
you know, I have I have a great group of managers, including Alana and Aaron, and they do all the hands on with the staff. But really, the veterinarians are more my responsibility to, you know, if they have issues, we can discuss and try to make sure, you know, what can we do to, to make things better or to make things better for your horses? Because that's often what it is. You know, there's a they want to change something or improve something. So we need to work on that. And like Alana said, there's a lot of meetings, a lot of meetings because we have a large staff. You know, we have over about 300 employees just here in Lexington. And then we have the wow. other two hospitals in, in Saratoga, New York and Wellington, Florida. So it is a network, but it's, it's a large, it's very labor intensive. So it's a large group and there's a lot that has to happen. And probably the biggest challenge I've had was our last year we changed our um, practice management software which that was uh. crazy. And you, you know, you really realize you need to depend on each and every person here, not only for patient care, but for also just for record keeping and the day to day and making sure that, you know, we can bill for our services as well. That was mm -hmm. quite a challenge. I'm going to retire if that ever happens again. <laughs> It's kind of one of those behind the scenes things that, you know, when you're new to it, you never think that that's going to have to be something you have to conquer someday. And then when you're in the midst of it, it's like, I'm sure it was very overwhelming. What was, when you were practicing as a veterinarian, what was your day-to-day -day like? My day-to-day -day when I was practicing, I was very specialized, which I think you'll find that in, in our hospital, much like, I don't know if Alana or Aaron said it, but you know, you want to be the very best at, at what you're doing. And we can be in this area because we have a high caseload. So you can really focus. And I had a predominantly thoroughbred yearling practice and focused on orthopedics. So I was looking at foals and then onto their yearling year, doing a lot of radiographs, doing a lot of radiographic interpretation. That's what most of my, um, my work or my research has been on. And then working the public sales. So Right now, since I have kids, it was more, I, you know, I used to be able to come in pretty early because I'm a morning person and now I have to take the kids to school and then I'll go about my, my day, but I would go to farms. So I was ambulatory and I would go to probably three, four, five farms towards the end of my career as a veterinarian. Early in my career, you know, you're, you're like a pinball machine. You're just going everywhere and trying to do every little thing so that you can learn and you can get clients and, and then you develop it and you develop um, more of a caseload and a following. And I would go to three or four, maybe five farms in a day and look at their yearlings and make recommendations, whether they were, I would do some sick yearlings as well, not my favorite, but mostly lamenesses. And that's what I truly enjoy was mm -hmm. blocking horses out and determining where they're lame, then doing the diagnostics, either x-ray or ultrasound, is what we can do in the field and then treating them and seeing where we can go and hopefully getting a better product to sell in the end, you know, from the, from the thoroughbred standpoint. And for me, that was really since kids is more like a eight to four job. Um, it's definitely not that way for the majority of like the people doing repro, they're starting at 5 a.m. going out and helping these mares so that they wow. know when to send them to the breeding shed. But again, they are done probably around three or four. I say done, that was with routine work. So there are still emergencies, um, much less in the orthopedic world as there would be in the reproductive world because you have sick mm -hmm. foals and just general routine care from the farm that you'll have more emergencies in, in that type of practice. Mm -hmm. But the good thing about that is we are a large practice and we do have people that are on call too. You know, So you're not on call every single day, all the time. I mean, I'm sure there's, in the spring, you are. So everybody gets that feeling and they know they don't want to do that for 24, 7, 365. Yeah. So, um, and we're making some good strides in that. You know, it's veterinary medicine, especially equine veterinary medicine has been known for, you know, very hard work, very poor hours. And, and we're striving to do better with that, especially in the off season. In, during the busy breeding season, people are working a lot. A lot more mm -hmm. than probably they should be. 
That's important. We, I'm glad that you covered that because that's a big piece of having these horse racing hangouts is we do want to talk about the realities, both the tough realities and the, the highs and the lows of these different positions. You mentioned in there, I know you guys have facilities in Saratoga Springs and Wellington, Florida as well. What are kind of the differences in the majority equine populations you serve in each area between Lexington, Kentucky, you know, Wellington, Saratoga Springs is in upstate New York for anybody who doesn't know. So for Lexington, we're about 70% thoroughbred and 30% other breeds. And we see last year, I think they saw 151 different breeds, which is just shocking. I don't think wow. I can do 151 different breeds, but we do, we do have a wide range in that 30%. Now, Wellington is the exact opposite, where about 30% would be racehorses or thoroughbreds, and the other 70% would be show horses. And then Saratoga, which is also a large breeding area for thoroughbreds, it's, it's more thoroughbred predominant, but it's like 60-40. So about 60% thoroughbreds and 40% other breeds. So we, we, we do see everything and we're far more intensive on the racing industry here because we have the surgery to take care. We have surgery at all the practices, but we have just a large caseload here mm -hmm. because of the location. Yeah. So I want to move on to the part, this is this is actually kind of our wrap up, but I'm thinking with all of you guys and the amazing information you've shared, it might take us a little while on this and bring up some other discussion points. I would love for each of you to share three to five action points that a young person could start doing right now. Say somebody who's in, you know, later on in high school or early in college, um, if they aspire to to one of your careers. So Alana, I'm going to I'm going to start with you on this one. 3 to 5 action points or pieces of advice in general that you would give to someone. Okay. I will say that I interview a lot of young people that are pursuing um, degrees that that I'm not sure how marketable they are, how many job options there are. Um, I would encourage them to check out a veterinary tech program if they're interested in, in working with horses or animals of some sort and um, as a career, and they, but they don't want to be a veterinarian. So there's two, three, and four-year programs. There's also online programs. Um, I would encourage them to check that out as well as if they decide to not go that route and, and go into something else to, to look at the after they graduate, what's available for them and is it going to pay them a difference uh, for that degree? Cause there's a lot of um, equine science, myself being one. And if you aren't going to go on to vet school, you know, all of the stuff that you, um, you know, learn in that is all very great and helpful. Uh, but it's also something that you, you would learn along the way in positions like Aaron and I, would offer. Um, so that would be one of them. Uh, I think being coachable is very, very important. Um, I interview a lot of people every year and if they have not worked with thoroughbreds or standardbreds or they have horse experience and it's mostly their own horse experience, you know, it's, it's difficult, um, to get them to be a little bit cautious when they first start uh, with us because they they assume that everything is like what they own and the horses that we see are not you know the majority of them are are manageable fairly easily but there's several of them that you know you want to be careful with um so that i would say being coachable and just listening and um yeah i think and you know passion is something that everyone says they have passion for the horse and I think that's definitely important, but I think you need to have a little grit as well. So, you know, it, it gets passion will get you maybe to March. So, but grit will get you get grit will get you through. Um, yeah, I think that, and just be be open minded. We have fun. Um, we all work together. We have hard days, and uh, yeah, we we enjoy it. I love that. Passion will get you till March. That might be the most accurate thing I think I've ever heard ever. <laughs> That's it's really interesting. I don't have the vast amount of experience that that any of you guys do when it comes to interviewing and hiring people. But even in in the short time that I've interviewed and and done some a little bit of coaching to young people who want to get involved in the industry and bring people into our mentorship program. That's 
one of the number one things I hear from kids is mm -hmm. I'm very passionate about it. Yeah. I'm passionate about learning more, but I really like that. Passion only gets you so far before you really have to. It's hard know, to be passionate when you have full diarrhea all over you or, you know, if you're in working with isolation cases, that kind of thing. So, yeah. Yeah. Aaron, what are your three to five points for us? Um, yeah. Re be realistic. I think that's the, the, I'm with Alana on the one thing I, I do interview a lot of, uh, kids coming out of college with, um, with, um, degrees that they think they're going to make six figures on going right out of college. I'm like, yeah, no, you're not gonna do that. Um, just be realistic, um, in recognizing what, what's available out there. Um, mm -hmm. if you, this, this, this job is totally one that you can touch all the main points, um, handling horses, working recovery, um, working in surgery, um, working radiology, working with diagnostic tools, being an ambulatory technician. There's so many different avenues of it, but kind of have an idea of where you want to go. If you do want to come in, um, we have, um, we'll have people that interview for, well, put out for multiple jobs and they'll be like, well, I can do that one or I can do that one or I can do that one. So just, just you know, know kind of where you want to head. How about that? Know where you want to at least start off. Um, mm -hmm. We do hire from within. And if, if you're someone who's really good, I, I bet you we've had at least 10 people that have worked in four to five different jobs here and they're really well, you know, well-rounded. Um, another point, let's see. Um, be available. <laughs> um, I also get someone that says, well, I can work from, you know, nine to four on these days, but weekends are out and forget holidays. I'm like, yeah, well, horses need to eat on the holidays and uh, weekends are definitely when you're going to have to work. So I think those are my three big ones, but if you tell me when you can't work more than you, when you can, then you're kind of probably off the table. So. Dr. Spike Pierce. Okay. For me, I think horse skills are really important. Um, I would not be where I am today if I wasn't a very good horse person growing up. I, I spent a lot of time working with horses. And so I think anytime you can get that hands-on experience, it's really important. But I didn't touch a thoroughbred till I came to Kentucky. And I want people to know that because it, you don't have to have just thoroughbred experience to come into this world. I had none. I had standard breads and I had a Morgan that I showed and a Shetland pony that I had growing up. So you can really do it, but do make the effort to learn how to handle different horses. And they are different or just learn good horsemanship, knowing where to be, because that applies to any horse. But I came from standard breads, they strike. And so I was very good with that. And I knew when a horse was going to strike and I knew where to stand thoroughbreds bite and that's quite different <laughs> and I, I hadn't experienced that till I came here but I quickly learned that when I'm holding onto a horse I need to hold on to the halter not just the shank like oh. it's so so there are just little things that you will learn and just watch and and you you will learn and I have some interns that will come through and really put themselves in some bad spots and so I, that's always a goal is to make sure that they don't get hurt and that they do really learn good horsemanship, but that's something you can pick up before you come into any of these jobs by visiting places. Mm -hmm. and, th and that leads to my, my next thing is really taking opportunities. So when you have the, um, the option or the, the time to go visit someplace, do it. I didn't have any, any idea what it was like down here. And I came down, I'm like, oh my goodness, I, I want to be there. I want to go there and learn what they're teaching. And it was because I came down here, I took that opportunity to come down. I always considered myself very lucky. And Dr. Bramlage would say, you're not lucky. You make good decisions. And, and he's right. You, you have to choose what you're going to do. So if you can go out and look at things, maybe go to an Arab farm and see how that's done. Go to a, a thoroughbred farm. Go to the races. Just, just see what happens at the races. I think if, if you're interested in the equine industry, try to go a lot of different places. There are so many people that I have met in central Kentucky, whether it's farm managers, um, veterinarians, that 
you know, had, they, they may have had horse experience, but very, very few had thoroughbred experience before they um, came, came into the positions that they are now. And I think finally, just always try to try, try to do your best and, and be honest. And I think from a veterinary standpoint, that's really important because not everything always goes well and we have tough cases. And I think you always have to be honest and make sure that you're asking somebody a question that when it needs to be asked versus being like, oh, I've got this. Because if, if it's, it's possible that you may not have the best decision for a horse. So always be open and honest and, and make sure that you lean on the people that are around you, especially here. There's so many experts here. I, it's, it's a fabulous place to work because of that. But if you're not here, all of our referring veterinarians have the option to call here and ask a specialist, hey, what do you think about this? And they'll answer. So I think that's really important mm -hmm. as well. And have fun. That's my final one. Have fun. Because that, that is honestly what brought me here was how much fun it was. And I think Aaron and Alana can totally agree with me on that. When when we first yeah. started, we were like, this is, this is fun. Yes, you're not going to say anything. <laughs> I want to I want to ask a follow up question to your to your one about take opportunities and I invite all of you guys to tune in because you you know you do bring in interns and externs from a lot of different places. What advice would you have for someone who maybe lives in a state or even even another country that wants to come and take the opportunity and come to Kentucky or go to Wellington or go to Saratoga Springs and is nervous about traveling? You know, what advice would you give to that person? Because a lot of people do have to relocate to be involved in, in the industry in some way. And, and this is kind of the heart of especially the thoroughbred industry here in Lexington. I think if you're nervous about trying, you, are you referring to because of COVID? No, I was just referring in general, just to relocating, you know, relocating okay. to take an opportunity to be involved in the industry. Because for some people that could be a big job. Right. Absolutely. And that's why I think visiting is very important because I think you need to see if it's for you. That's why when I externed, that was my opportunity that I took and I came down here. It's like, oh my goodness. And that's when I said, I have no problem leaving. Did I really think I was going to leave and come to Kentucky when I did an internship? No. The vets that I worked for said, we'll never see you again. And, and they were right. And I didn't want to believe that at the time. But I think once you see what you can do and where you can be, that that takes the fear out of it because you're finding your place and but it, but you have to give yourself that opportunity to find that place so it it becomes much less scary once you take that jump but visit absolutely visit places the, the opportunities are out there and i think financially you know why i came to here was because i had no money i could drive here and they had housing so mm -hmm. that's why i came to root and riddle and that is something for externs that we have here is free housing. So if you can get here, and there's also many vet schools that have um, different programs to, for you to apply for money to get to externships as well. So that there is money out there, I think that you can, you can make it happen, but you have to search for it a little bit. Mm -hmm. Well, Aaron, Alana, Dr. Spike Pierce, thank you all so much for coming on tonight and, and sharing your knowledge and all of your experience with us. Uh, as, if someone wants to follow up and has any questions for any one of you, where can I direct them to? Would you like them to contact me and I direct them, direct you guys questions? Or is there a place where they could contact Rudin Riddle? I think you can contact you or, I mean, we all have individual email addresses that, I mean, mine's dspike at rudenriddle.com. I'm happy to field any questions about veterinary medicine. And you can always contact Alana regarding any of the, the internship, externship opportunities and Aaron as well. I mean, we can, I, I will let them speak of whether they are fine receiving those, but absolutely. Awesome. And as a follow up to this episode, I'll share, you know, the links to your guys' internship and externship opportunities online. So if anybody watched and, and wants to take that next step, uh, then they at least know where to go to find that info. So thank you all so much. I want to give you the rest of your night back. And uh, I hope you have a wonderful evening and, and that your spring is off to a, a beautiful start.
Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. Yes. appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah. Bye, guys. Bye. Awesome. Wow. What a great episode with the Rudin Riddle team. I'm so thankful that we were able to have them on and see and learn all of those different perspectives about equine healthcare. I hope that tonight gave you guys a, you know, a well-rounded view of all the opportunities that are out there. Uh, I think something that I actually learned tonight was when Dr. Spike Pierce was talking about the different services they offer and even talked about what all went into ambulatory medicine, uh, it's, you know, even that is a much wider area than, than I thought initially. So I hope that this has inspired you and given you some insight and, and new bits of knowledge about, you know, maybe areas of the industry that you want to go research or look up or maybe eventually specialize in. So if you want to contact me or Amplify, if you have any questions as a follow-up to this episode, you can get in touch with me at info at amplifyhorseracing.org. And then uh, our website is www.amplifyhorseracing.org. If you're interested in our mentorship program, you can find all of that there. And then also very exciting for anyone who has stayed tuned to our uh, Young Adults Equine Careers Tour Series that we're doing throughout this summer. We are actually going to be visiting Rudin Riddle as part of that tour series in September. So stay tuned for the registration for that. I hope you all have a wonderful evening and I will see you on the next 